Welcome to Qualified Opinions, where we test the ideas and limits, the knowns and known unknowns around freedom and order in contemporary politics and society. We invite you to listen as we engage with leading and emerging thinkers across disciplines and issues who will sharpen our thinking on the topics shaping our discourse. Welcome back. Today, we're diving into the world of constitutional law and individual liberty with a true heavyweight in the field, Randy Barnett. Randy is a professor of constitutional law at Georgetown University Law Center. He's the author of the new book, Memoir, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. Get ready for a fascinating journey through Professor Barnett's life his evolution as a legal scholar, and his unwavering commitment to originalism and libertarianism. We'll explore how his experience have shaped his interpretation of the Constitution and his fierce defense of individual liberty. Randy, thank you for joining us. Well, it's great to be here, Varnique, and it's great to see you virtually here and the video setup that you and I have to talk to each other. It makes it easier, and uh, it's just great to see you again. It's great. So usually I ask my guests to tell me how they got there, but this is what your book is about. So we're not going to do this and we're going to dive right into it. So I want to start with a basic question, the title, which I thought was great, A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. So, I mean, basic question, what is originalism? Sure. Originalism is uh, such a basic common sense idea. It can be summarized in one sentence, and that is the meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. The meaning of the Constitution should remain the same until it's properly changed by amendment. It's an idea so basic that there wasn't even a name for that approach until 1980 uh, when it was given that name by a critic of originalism. Uh, in one of the most successful examples of uh, labeling that any constitutional uh, or law professor has ever done, he named this opposition position originalism and it took off. And nor was there a theory of originalism in 1980 when Paul Brest is the person I'm talking about did this. He therefore had to, in order to criticize the position, he had to reconstruct uh, maybe two or three variations on originalism before he could refute them. So it was from 1980 until today that we see the rise of originalism as a theory of constitutional law or constitutional interpretation. Prior to that, it was just common sense that when you have a something, you have a document, if it's a constitution or it's a contract or it's even a, a private letter, the meaning of that document is fixed at the time it's it's put forward. So one of the things that I find striking, actually, about the way you define so simply originalism uh, goes at the heart of uh, one of the misunderstanding about originalism. When you hear people, and obviously I'm not a legal scholar, so I didn't really quite realize until I really read the book and, and listened to you talk about it. Uh, it's like you have the feeling that people believe that originalism, what's wrong with it, is like effectively people who push for originalism want us to live the way the founders wanted us to leave because it's kind of a understanding of the constitution that cannot change. And I thought kind of, I, I, I I bought, I guess a little bit into this conception only because the opposition seems to be the living constitution. So it seemed that you had those two kind of theory or position about the constitution or interpretation of the constitution that were opposing each other, but that's not at all what originalism is. No. Uh, and one of the things that I think it's worth noting about the book is, though, even though it's sort of billed as a memoir and my life story, which, of course, as you know, it is, it's also the history of two intellectual movements that I've been a part of for 40 years. And the first is the libertarian political movement, or at least the philosophical movement, which I've been a part since I was of in, since I was in law school, I became a libertarian in college, and we can talk about that. And second is the uh, conservative legal movement, of which I'm a libertarian member. And I became a part of that. And then as I was uh, doing that for quite a while, I eventually became an originalist. I wasn't an originalist in the beginning. I rejected originalism because I was persuaded by Paul Brest's argument against it. I thought they were persuasive until I came up with a different version of originalism that I thought would withstand criticism 
uh, which, which, which would withstand his criticisms. And that became original public meaning originalism, uh, which is the most dominant form of originalism today. So the book tells the story not only of my life story, but it tells the story of these two intellectual movements that I've been really, really involved in. So it's funny that you should say this because I actually I was thinking of commenting on that point. This is one of the reasons why this book is so interesting to me. And this is why, I mean, I, I told you before we started this interview, I gave it to, uh, to my daughter and I gave it also to a friend of hers because it is, it feels really that it's the history of libertarianism as a political theory and originalism. And so there's, it's, it's, it's more, I mean, it's interesting for those of us who know you, right. Uh, to kind of actually get, I mean, and I assume for, for most people to get kind of the, the backstory, the Randy backstory, but I just think it's fascinating for anyone who wants to understand from a very different perspective than the one actually I have, because I came about it starting in France, where it was like, what, three of us, right? And and then I had only one thought, come to the U.S. to join that movement. I just didn't have that backstory and I thought it was just really in- interesting. So, uh, but let's, I want to, I want to kind of actually kind of go, I was thinking about, here's how we can go about this interview. I thought I was going to explore, because it's a big book and I really recommend that people read it, but I was thinking of going about asking you kind of three, three big theme, how Randy became a libertarian, how Randy became a constitutional scholar, and how Randy became an originalist. Cover those three things, and then maybe cover, to the extent that we have time, the two Supreme Court cases. I mean, there's more, but that kind of book ends the book. And at, at first, it's kind of an interesting book because it starts with a Supreme Court case, the Reich case. And I thought it's a weird way of going about it. But actually, when you read the book, then it makes actually a lot of sense to think about it. So uh, let's start with how you became a libertarian, because you weren't always from a young age. You were a liberty minded uh, conservative. Uh, by the way, when I say a young age, like you were 12. I mean, at 12, I was, I don't know what I was doing, but I wasn't doing that, you know? So can you talk to us about your evolution from being a conservative to becoming a libertarian? Sure. And as you know, it, you know, this is occupies a good portion of the book. Um, so I'll have to be, I'll try to force myself to be, give you the yeah. abbreviated version. Uh, well, I, as I got my political principles from my father and who was a political conservative and a Jewish kid from the south side of Chicago. And we grew up in a suburb further south, uh, further south of of Chicago. So that's where I got my political ideas from. By the time I was 12 years old, I debated on behalf of Barry Goldwater in front of my entire junior high school and grade school student body, several hundred students. I still have my debate notes from that. That's why I was able to quote directly from what my summation was at the age of 12 and so I, you know, I got what information you could get pre-internet in a place like Calumet City. I mean, even for that debate, I had to ride my bicycle across town to go to the Republican uh, Party headquarters in uh, the in old uh, Calumet City, which is where I grew up, and got the, both, the the books and the pamphlets, and that's where we got the information from. So it was kind of hard. We subscribed to. Uh, U.S. News and World Report tried to keep up with things. It was, which was not really a very good source of information. Uh, I got to college and discovered philosophy, which is, I talk a lot about in the book, mm-hmm. which had a huge impact on my on the fact. It actually, it's why I became a professor. It's because I discovered philosophy. Otherwise, I had no idea. I didn't know any, what philosophy was in high school, and I didn't think about being a professor. My goal was to be a criminal lawyer, which I decided upon because of a TV show that I watched when I was ten years old called The Defenders. That inspired me to be a criminal lawyer. So I, f- I found out about libertarianism from a, cl- a classmate of mine, who um, Jeanette DeWise Wolf, who is actually a journalist, uh, works for the San Diego Reader, or did for many years work for the San Diego Reader. Uh, but she and I were, uh, uh, she lived in a, a different dorm than I did, but we ate in the same place and we became good friends. And she and her boyfriend, Steve Wolf, who she eventually married, discovered libertarianism as members of Young Americans for Freedom, which was then a Buckley, a William F. Buckley conservative group. And she started to tell me about it. And I told her I didn't want to hear about it because the word libertarian sounded weird to me. I mean, I don't know if I told her that's why I didn't want to hear about it. But I remember that the reason I didn't want to hear about it is because I thought the word sounded weird. That was the end of that. 
she was very respectful. I mean, she was a good friend of mine. But we and eventually you, and you we, give her credit for really helping you. Actually, this is a book where you thank your mentors and and friends along the way. Yeah, it's uh, one of the lessons of the book is uh, that people should take away from it is you should a cultivate mentors, which means be a good protege, treat them well, but also thank them while you still have a chance. Um, we don't. None of us become the people we are without. Uh, without the assistance of other people. And in Jeanette's case, I wouldn't say she was a mentor, but she's the one that mm -hmm. helped me study for my philosophy exams. And I don't think I could have gotten decent grades without her, you know, telling me what was what the material said. <laughs> <laughs> but then on top of that, she put you on a path that yeah. will stay with you for the rest of your life. Right. So then she invited, we, we ended up living in the same philosophy and religion residential college at Northwestern. And she brought John Cody, a, a, then a, an untenured classics professor, in to give a talk to our group about libertarianism. And I went to the thing because I was that was what we were doing. And I'm sitting there listening to it. And I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is a rational conservatism. This is what I've been looking for because conservatism had no theory. You couldn't read a book on first principles of conservatism. And not only that, it doesn't have a theory even today. You still can't read a book on first principles of conservatism. It's a, it's a set of policies and positions and stances and a mindset, but it's not really a theory. And I think that's what I was looking for. And this seemed like it was a theory of a rational theory of conservatism. And, but there were some libertarian, you know, outlier positions that I thought were obviously wrong. I ultimately met with John Cody at the student union several times over the next several months as I was arguing with him. And he met with this, you know, I was a junior in, in college and he was meeting with me, you know, just to convince me to be a libertarian. And eventually I kept posing objections to him and he kept having answers. So finally I started thinking, well, maybe he's right and I'm wrong. So by the senior, my senior year of college, I taught a student credited course, a student organized seminar for credit at Northwestern in the residential college on libertarianism. And I assigned Murray Rothbard and David Friedman and Robert Heinlein, the Tannehills, the Perkinses, for those people who are libertarians might remember what those books were like. And we had a class uh, and I taught it. Uh, John Cody was the advisor. And that, that from that point forward, I was a libertarian and I got involved in the libertarian movement, the intellectual movement, when I was a first year law student. I'm, as I was on my way on to Harvard Law School, I sent a fan, a long fan letter to Murray Rothbard asking him a whole bunch of questions. And um, he didn't write back right away, but he gave a copy. He did eventually write back, but he gave a copy of the letter to another guy who was starting law school, John Hagel III, who was in the joint JD MBA program at Harvard. And John called me up, said Murray's a friend of his, and let's get together and have coffee. We met at Harvard Square and had coffee. And Eventually, not that long after that, John brought me down to New York to meet Murray and um, Leonard, Le Leonard Leggio, and we ultimately ended up that evening, the very day I met Murray in Murray Rothbard's living room, you know, talking to him about the hypotheticals that were tormenting us as first-year law students. And that was the beginning of my friendship with Murray Rothbard and the beginning of him being one of my mentors. One of the things that I really enjoy about the book is, is how seriously you think about ideas and how seriously you take on the challenges that mentors or or people more, more seniors present to you. So in the chapter uh, called You're Not a Libertarian, You're a Propertarian, you write, the freedom to actualize one's potential is the end and property only the means. And that comes after basically, this is your conclusion after you've been po posed a challenge by a professor because you were, uh, actually, was he a professor? I can't yes, remember. Yeah, yeah he's he, a very he was famous. A, yeah, yeah, he was a professor, right? He's a very famous law professor named Ronald Dworkin, who yes, was a professor that's right. at Oxford. That's right. And um, was visiting at Harvard Law School and did me a big favor by allowing me to do an independent study for him in my last semester of law school. I had to drop a course the previous semester because I'd stopped going to it and couldn't understand a word the professor said the day I showed yeah. up for class and, you know, made a bargain with God that if uh, I just didn't get called on in that class, I'd go right to the registrar's office and drop that class, which I did, but I had to pick up three hours so I could graduate. I picked up some seminar, who knows what it was. And then I picked, I needed one more hour and I went to Ronald, Ronald Dworkin and said, would, can I do an independent study with you? And he said, yes, he didn't have to. And I ended up doing my paper, criticizing a chapter of his then new book, Taking Right Seriously, 
which was about his his book chapter was about why there is no general right to liberty. And then I wrote a paper arguing uh, the title of which was Taking Liberty Seriously, which I only reread after 40 some years, maybe longer than that, to write the book. It's not actually so bad. I, I'm thinking of putting yeah. a posting on an SSRN for people to be able to read this uh, this critique I have of Dworkin. But what I th- what I think is interesting, right, is that you're taking this seminar with this professor who is not on your side, broadly speaking, and that leads. It's the conversations that you have with with him that leads you to basically refine how you think liberty and property, two things that you value highly, fit together. Well. Veronique, actually, you're kind of it's it's interesting. You're compressing a lot because I didn't really take that moment to refine my views. I mean, I wrote the paper about why that, which was my response to that question, which I work out about how you have to have property in order to figure out what liberty really is. Because liberty is not the freedom to do whatever you will; it's the freedom to do whatever you will with what's yours. So without the prior concept of property, you can't even know what liberty consists of. That was the position I argued mm-hmm. that that was the Rothbardian position. Didn't really change my views at all at that point, but I never forgot yeah. the interchange. And it's only been recently in recent years, in the last year or two, that I've started to think, well, actually, I don't know that we've actually told the story about what he asked me. So let me just say what yeah. it was. So I was meeting with him to talk about my paper. And I gave him that answer that I just yeah. gave you, which is that you need property in order to decide what liberty is. And his response, among his many responses to me, the one I remember was, he says, well, if you had a choice between more to having more liberty or having more property, which, which would you choose? So I said, because I had this view that property defines liberty, I would have to choose more property because that would yeah. mean we'd have more liberty, right? So I would choose more property. And he said, well, then you're not a libertarian. You're a propertarian. Mm-hmm. So that's the answer that stuck with me all these years. And it's only been in the last year or so that I've started to think that uh, one of the problems with le- modern libertarianism is it's a little too concerned with liberty and a, I mean, a little too concerned with property in the sense of private property and not as quite as much concerned with liberty in the sense of freedom as maybe it should be. And that's really the subject of what I hope will be my next book on libertarianism, which mm-hmm. might be my last book that I write on sort of uh, updating libertarianism. Uh, don't, sell, don't sell yourself short, Randy. <laughs> so, but uh, I, I just thought kind of that chapter is really important because it shows how one moment in your life, yeah, maybe you didn't actually, first, it's the first, this forced you to actually try to refine how you, thought about the connection with one another and it's stuck with you. I mean, it's very clear that it's, it, it kind of like, it stays with you. A lot of these questions, a lot of these challenges stay with you and you, you wrestle with it. Maybe it's because is, isn't that what the Jewish people are supposed to do, right? I mean, isn't that their name for God? But I mean, I, I thought that was kind of a, a chapter to me that kind of summed up nicely a lot of the way you lived your intellectual life. But that's how I read it. Well, I I do most of the work that I do. My writing is basically to get myself to figure out what I think is right. It's, it's only very secondarily to influence other people. It's mostly how I work out truth and what's true and what's not true. And what is the end? The end is the end that has unified my entire career from the time I watched the TV show, The Defenders. And my end is uh, justice. I have a very strong interest in justice. I started off thinking that being a criminal lawyer was the way to achieve justice, and it is the way to achieve justice case by case, but eventually decided to segue into trying to achieve justice on a more wholesale or societal level by figuring out, first and foremost, well, what is justice? Which is why the name of my first monograph was The Structure of Liberty, Justice, and the Rule of Law, Uh, trying to figure out what justice really is. And I don't think we can aim at something unless we have some idea of what we're aiming at. So it's not part of my question, but what is justice? <laughs> well, justice, I think, is everyone getting its due, his, his or her due. And that brings us to property and liberty and what is our due. And, and that's when you just have to start building out all the different subparts of what constitutes getting pe- having people get what, they, uh, what, they're, what they're entitled to. So let's uh, switch to uh, Mr. Ninth Amendment. 
So, uh, which is a nickname you got. So can you tell us the story about how you became a constitutional scholar? Because reading the book, it's not as if uh, all the, the, that you set yourself on that path from the beginning. To the contrary, I set myself against that path. When I was in law school, I took constitutional law from Larry Tribe, a famous Harvard law professor. It's gone a little round off the deep end on, on X in recent years. Uh, but brilliant guy. And uh, as a result of taking that class, I decided that the Constitution turned out not to be such a great idea after all. The reason being that every time I got to one of the good parts of the Constitution in the casebook that we were studying from, I would turn the page of the casebook and see that the Supreme Court had said that that, that provision doesn't mean anything or it, it, it doesn't limit government power. And all the reasons why I like the Constitution were sort of out, thrown out the window by the Supreme Court. So by the time I was done with the course, I was done with the Constitution as the way of protecting liberty. It didn't it seemed like it was a nice an idea that didn't seem to work out. But you still believed in the Constitution. Well, sort of. I mean, I believed I if you'd ask me, I mean, I sort of gave up on it, frankly. I just lost interest in it. Mm-hmm. If you'd have pressed me on this, I would have said, well, if we could have the what the Constitution actually says, that'd be great. But that's yeah. not what we've got. So forget about it. It didn't it didn't stop us from getting what we do have, which means it's a failure. Actually, this was an argument that Lysander Spooner made in his his famous essay, which I had read in college called No Treason, the Constitution of No Authority. I mean, he makes an argument that the Constitution is illegitimate because it lacks appropriate consent. That was an argument that I responded to in my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. I gave the argument against Spooner's position. But he made a uh, a subordinate argument. And that is, regardless of what the character of the Constitution is, what we have today, he said, is not that. And the Constitution was unable to stop what we have today from happening. So even if it was the greatest Constitution in the world, it obviously was ineffective in preventing us from having what we now have, which was he was writing in 1860, which he was getting a new federal, big federal government is what we were getting. So I sort of agreed with, I already knew that position was available. I sort of agreed with Spooner that uh, the Constitution was a waste of time. And I then stuck with plan A, which was to be criminal lawyer. And then when I became a law professor, I became a contracts professor because I believe in freedom of contract and contract law is generally sound. In contract law, writings are taken seriously. What you actually put down on paper matters a lot. And uh, then only got drawn into constitutional law against my better judgment and against my will in a way. The Federal Society, which is a, a coalition of libertarian and conservative uh, conservatives, originally started as a student associate, a student society. It was a grassroots group. Uh, students made this society, and in their fifth year, they had their fifth annual student symposium at Stanford. And somebody I had been lecturing, uh, who was a student of mine at an IHS summer seminar named Brian Brilly, who was at that time a student, an MBA student at Harvard, then went to law school at Stanford, and he became the head of the of that organizing that conference. And then he, because he'd heard me lecture in the summer seminar, asked me to come and speak. And I said, well, you know, Brian, Brian Brilly, I think I already said his name. You know, Brian, I don't do the constitution. I just don't, it's not what I do. And he said, oh, well, you know, you know, you're a smart guy. You only have to talk for 10 minutes. I'm sure you can think of something to say. So I said, well, okay. I mean, the reason I said yes is because there were all these fancy professors and everybody on the program. And I want, I was a, you know, a junior professor at Chicago Kent College of Law, a relatively obscure place. And I kind of wanted to go to the fancy, you know, hang out with all the, the fancy people. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And uh, the panel that they asked me to be on was a panel on freedom of association. The overall conference was a conference on the First Amendment. But the panel I was invited on was a panel on freedom of association. And something your listeners may immediately think about is the fact that it doesn't say freedom of association in the First Amendment. It, First Amendment protects the right of, of uh, speech, press, and assembly, but not association. So I gave this whole thing about the Constitution, which I actually, there, you can see it on YouTube. I, I found the video, so I was able to transcribe what I actually said into the book. I basically, I said, you know, at the end of my talk, I said, well, what gives unelected lifetime appointed judges the power to protect this right, freedom of association, that isn't even mentioned in the First Amendment? And I was consciously patterning that question after a, quest, a rhetorical question that Clint Eastwood asks in Dirty Harry when, before he's about to shoot the bad guy. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or only five? Well, anyway, so I did this thing. 
And the punchline to my rhetorical question was the Ninth Amendment. And the Ninth Amendment, I'm sure everyone has memorized, uh, (laughs) says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So I just said, you know, I asked this rhetorical question and I said, well, in the Constitution, it says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny others retained by the people. And I got this very nice ovation and actually the entire program panel started pivoting to debating the Ninth Amendment. So it was very satisfying. So I had to decide when I went back to Chicago Kent after the conference, well, you know, do I do anything about it? Well, one of the things I knew from taking constitutional law is the Ninth Amendment is never followed. It is completely uh, um, uh, ignored. I th- can I just de- deviate to yeah, a sure. side story? Because I think of the one, one that you'll appreciate, uh, you know, Ari Lepage, mm-hmm. uh, the famous French uh, author. Well, I was at a conference in Aix-en-Provence uh, speaking about uh, something or another, and I was on a pr- either program with Ari, uh, Ari or I was listening to him, but I think I was on a program with him because uh, I was able to respond uh, to what he said. And he was saying how, you know, we're here at the, you know, very concerned about the European Union being too powerful and not protecting our, you know, all our rights. What we really need is what Randy Barnett has shown they have in the United States, and that is the Ninth Amendment. That's what we really need. <laughs> And it was very flattering. He'd read my Ninth Amendment stuff, and he was telling this audience of European students uh, about the value of the Ninth Amendment. And I, I felt heartbroken when it came time, my turn to speak, to have to tell Ari that, in fact, the Ninth Amendment was a failure because it got ignored in the United States. And, and so, Except for freedom of association. Well, freedom of association is protected under the First Amendment as a kind of associated with freedom of speech. But I think the what makes it legitimate to do it is the, the Ninth, Ninth Amendment, Amendment, even though that's not what the courts say. But anyway, I got back to uh, I got back to uh, my my home school and I had to decide, well, you know, do I want to do anything about this? Do I want to re- research it? And it's kind of it's kind of considered it by scholars and, and lawyers to be a crank crank subject like UFOs or something. But I thought, you know, I'm, I've got tenure now or I'm about to have tenure and it's still in the Constitution. They haven't repealed it. So I ought to be able to talk about something that's still there. Then I had a research assistant go out and find everything that had been written on the Ninth Amendment. And he came back with a stack of uh, photocopy papers that was only about like an inch and a half or two inches thick, maybe at that, and a little teeny book called The Forgotten Ninth Amendment by Bennett Patterson. And so I looked at the pile of papers and I did a cost benefit analysis. I said, you know, if I can read everything in that pile of papers, that would make me the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment. So I read everything in the pile of papers and I became the nation's leading authority on the Ninth Amendment through a series of incidents that then happened, uh, which I talk about in the book. And that's how I got into con law with just this one crazy amendment is all I knew about constitutional law. And so it's gone from there. I mean, it turns out there's a lot more in the constitution besides the ninth amendment. I didn't really know that much about. Yeah. I mean, so when I was reading the story that you retold here, I was actually thinking about, uh, Robin Henson, the GMU professor here always said that he actually, the way he picks the topic he's going to be talking about or studying is like, he looks at ignored topics, the things that seem important and, and, but are, ignored. And I wanted to ask you actually about the Ninth Amendment. Is it that at the time, judges on the bench considered that effectively the Ninth Amendment had been erased? Or was it more the academics in academia where people thought, eh, the Ninth Amendment just doesn't matter? Or or were they failing to kind of actually see things like freedom of association is not protected because of the First Amendment, I mean, it is, but it is really because of the Ninth Amendment, and hence it means we're inconsistent about it. Um, It's a good question. I I think it was mostly the courts. Academics weren't very academic. Law professors were not very academic until like the 1980s when they Mm -hmm. became more theoretical uh, and uh, more scholarly inclined. They were more like teaching how you practice law kind of stuff. And they were very learned people, don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, they weren't, they were pretty conventional minded. And those courts had basically said in the 1940s that the Ninth Amendment doesn't really mean anything. Uh, is it basically, the, there's a case called United Postal Workers versus, uh, United Workers versus Mitchell. I mean, I think I got the name of the case right. I teach it all the time, but I'm, that wasn't what I was thinking of today. And there the court basically said, 
that the Ninth Amendment meant nothing. It basically said that as long as you have an enumerated power, the rights uh, reserved by the Ninth Amendment uh, were satisfied, which messed up even the text of the Ninth Amendment because in the Ninth Amendment, it speaks of rights retained by the people. The Tenth Amendment speaks of powers reserved by the people. So they ran the two clauses together. This was the Supreme Court of the United States doing this. Mm-hmm. I read that in in the Gunther case book when I was a law student. I mean, they obviously didn't care about the text of the Constitution, at least not as much as they should. Well, talking about uh, actually things that they didn't care about or mistakes were made when I was reading uh your chapter on rights, which, which is the, the beginning of the book. I mean, you were talking about how, uh, is it Wickard and Philburn? Wickard v. Philburn, th- correct. Yes, that there too, there was a complete misunderstanding of what it actually meant. Right. Well, the Supreme Court didn't even hasn't even, didn't even interpret Wickard correctly. Yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's that's their I own was, case. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I was kind of like, I mean, interacting with you is not good for me because I kind of, I had this idea of the American constitution as being this awesome thing that was holding the country together and all this. And then, you know, after reading your 14th amendment book where effectively it's, we have this awesome amendment and then you know, the Supreme Court kind of pretty much erased it <laughs> out it of the Constitution. And then and then I'm reading things about the Ninth Amendment and I'm like, and I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, have been I've been holding this ideal and uh, but I mean you you're working you're working on restoring the lost constitution. Right. So that's the name of the book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. And the Lost Constitution is not what constitutional law was before the New Deal. The lost constitution are all the clauses that the court has said don't mean anything and don't operate. That the constitution is like an is like an airplane, a jet airplane with four engines. And one by one, the Supreme Court has snuffed out one of the engines. Now, if you if you're down to one engine, and we're you know pretty much down to one engine now, if you're down to one engine, the plane can still fly, but it's not the greatest situation to be in. Uh, you, the, that redundancy is built into airplanes for a purpose, and the courts have been systematically re- eliminating the redundant safeguards of liberty that have been built into the Constitution. I will say that the rise of the originalist movement that I've been a part of has taken considerable steps to restoring some of the lost Constitution. Yeah, and we're going to we'll talk about this. So now let's move about how you became an originalist. Right. Well, I wasn't. I was a Dworkinian. My professor was yeah. Ronald Dworkin. Dworkin had a view that is reflected in his masterpiece called Law's Empire, that the Constitution should be given a moral reading, which is it should be made the best it can be. Uh, and so you should take whatever is open-ended in the Constitution and read it in the most moral way possible. Of course, different people will disagree. I had a more libertarian moral reading than he would have had. And so I thought that's because I thought originalism had been refuted by Paul Brest. Which, what uh, were, can you tell us what his main arguments were? Brest. Oh, what Brest's arguments yeah. were? Well, his main argument uh, was against what you would t- today call framers' intent. And the argument was we should not be bound by the framers of the Constitution, which is what he was criticizing. The, and he was criticizing the work of Robert Bork and Raoul Berger, both of whom relied on the framers' intent. And we should not be bound by the framers' intent because, first and foremost, there is no singular framers' intent. There were many framers mm-hmm. in Philadelphia, many more in ratification conventions. It depends on who you're talking about. But if you're just talking about the people in, in Philadelphia, there's you know 100 people there, and they all have different intentions. There's no group intent. And so it was completely a fool's errand to try to figure out what the framers' intent would be. And then there's all the other objections to framers' intent, which is why should we be bound by the dead hand of the past? Why should we be bound by these dead white guys and what they said over 200 years ago, when we today, we the people, we the living, uh, need to govern ourselves. So there are all these arguments against framers' intent, and I was persuaded by them, and I'm still persuaded by them to a large degree. And it was only because I just happened to be teaching a seminar on constitutional theory at Boston University. I'd moved to Boston University by this time. And in a footnote to one of the articles in an anthology I had assigned, there was a citation to a book called, or a, a, I didn't even know it was a book, a writing called The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, written in 1845 by Lysander Spooner. Now, I knew who Lysander Spooner was from this essay that I'd read in college, No Treason, 
that's all I knew about Spooner. That and the fact that he had started his own post office at some point to compete with the U.S. Post Office. Uh, that's all I knew about Spooner. And I had no idea that he'd written anything else, much less a book arguing in 1845 that slavery was unconstitutional. What could he possibly have said? So I had my library get me a copy of whatever this was. It turned out it was a 280 page book, part of the collected works of six volume collected works of Lysander Spooner, who knew the guy wrote that much. And I read this book and wow, uh, it was I had just this huge uh, epiphany because he identified a different version of originalism than the one that I was familiar with, Framers Intent Originalism. He identified what he called he said we shouldn't be looking at the framers intent we should be looking at the original meaning of the text what did the text mean so is he the original originalist yeah, yeah yes and no uh, because i do think originalism is just common sense and i think the founders and everybody else when it comes to interpreting a writing has common sense he's not and you and you ended up disagreeing with Lysander Spooner I did with his conclusion about slavery. Mm -hmm. I I, I agreed with his methodology, but I thought he was ultimately wrong about the subject he was writing about, whether the Constitution, um, whether slavery was unconstitutional. I think his conclusion was wrong. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The book wasn't about how to read the Constitution. It was about slavery. And in there, he laid out how he was thinking about it. Yeah. And how he read the Constitution. And actually- One of the things that you don't know about when you just read his book, and it took me a while to figure it out, is that book was written as a response to another anti-slavery or abolitionist named Wendell Phillips. Wendell Phillips was a close associate of William Lloyd Garrison. Uh, These are today referred to as the radical abolitionists. Mm -hmm. And they were then called the radicals then as well. And their position was the Constitution was a covenant with death and an agreement with hell because it sanctioned slavery. And so, therefore, at their rallies, uh, they would burn copies of the Constitution because it was so bad. And they favored dissolution, which meant dissolve the Union Mm -hmm. and let the free states go their own way. That's what they favored. This was very unpopular amongst the people, which is why many anti-slavery people refused to call themselves abolitionists because they didn't want to be associated with those crazy people. But when uh, James Madison's notes, which had been of the Philadelphia Convention, were made public in 1840, having been kept secret all those years, Wendell Phillips, this Harvard-trained student of Joseph Story uh, lawyer, went through Madison's notes and found all the discussion of slavery and said, see, 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 we were right. The framers really did intend to protect slavery here and here and here. Look, look at these notes. And then two years later, or maybe a year later, I can't remember exactly, uh, Lysander Spooner wrote his book in response to Phillips. Now, what I discovered later on as I was becoming more an expert on anti-slavery constitutionalism, which is one of my subspecialties now, mm-hmm. is that Spooner's original book was only 145 pages long, not, not 280 pages long. And so he wrote this initial response to um, Phillips. He doesn't really mention Phillips because that was not the convention in those days. He just was giving his affirmative statement. Then Phillips goes out and publishes a 95-page uh, article refuting Spooner and then Spooner publishes The Unconstitutionality of, of Slavery, Second Part, which is a response to Phillips. They Both of those essays get put together to be the book I read, the 280-page book. And in this book, Spooner doesn't actually mention Phillips at all. You'd have to really figure out what the publication dates are to feel like they, these two pieces came and Phillips was in between. And, and But in the second part, in response to Phillips, pretty devastating response to Spooner, frankly. It was a pretty compelling one. Spooner lays out all these principles of interpretation. He then is, spends a lot of time talking about how you should interpret the Constitution. He gets very methodological, very theoretical at that point. And that's the theory that I read. At the time I first read it, I didn't realize that Phillips was playing a role in this thing at all. And then I realized, now this is a theory of originalism I could get behind. And as a, constitu- and as a legal theorist, which is what I normally do, I do legal theory, I can make something out of this theory. So I went to town and developed this theory into original meaning originalism. And uh, eventually this culminated in my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution in 2004. So I think I published a piece on on Lysander Spooner's theory of interpretation in 1998. In 1999, I came out as an originalist in in the Brendan Brown lecture I gave at Loyola of New Orleans called An Originalism for Non-Originalists. Originalism for Non-Originalists, which was a response to Brest saying, hey, look, don't look at Framer's intent. 
that's what Phillips and the anti slave and, and the abolitionists were looking at. We should look at public meaning instead, the meaning of the text that the public would have understood it to have. And that answered many of Brest's criticisms. And actually, when you go back and even look at Brest, he doesn't really rule out that p- possibility. He was arguing specifically against people who were asserting Framer's mm-hmm. intent. And so, but unbeknownst to me, while I was doing this work, Antonin Scalia, who ultimately goes on the Supreme Court and who I had met when he was a law professor at Chicago when I was there for a year before I went into teaching, he was urging people in the Justice Department, in the Reagan Justice Department under uh, Attorney General Ed Meese to forget about Framer's intent and just go with original meaning. So he had independently hit on the same idea than I that I had. He had hit on it because he was the editor of Regulation Magazine before he became a judge. And in Regulation Magazine, he sort of got offended by the reliance on legislative history, the frame, the intentions of individual congressmen to try to figure out what a statute meant. He said, no, you shouldn't be looking at the intentions of congressmen in particular. In particular, look at what the meaning of the statute is. And he took that theory over into constitutional law, unbeknownst to me. So by the time I published my book in 2004, I had, I had now known that Scalia had been doing this and I was able to ally myself with him. And of course, that's a, now by now he's a Supreme Court justice and it's a good guy to be allied with. And that helped boost my credibility within the conservative legal movement that my idea wasn't some cockamamie Randy Barnett theory, but it's the same theory Antonin Scalia had. But here's the theory of why Antonin Scalia is right. And that's kind of how I became an originalist. And I mean, and it's funny because originally there weren't that many of you, but now, I mean, arguably, originalism is very well represented. I mean, not in probably the form you would like it to be represented all the time, but on the Supreme Court. Well, uh, actually, this is one of the rare examples of where I'm in the majority. As you know from the book, I, go, yeah. I, I admit that I'm a contrarian. And if I ever find myself in the majority, it makes me feel uncomfortable. I have to think maybe, what, have I, what am I missing yeah. here if, if, I'm, if I, everybody's agreeing with me? Original meaning originalism is the dominant form of originalism today. Not everyone agrees with it. There are academics who have their own twists on it. Uh, It is the dominant form of originalism today. Almost every judge who says, I would say almost every judge who says they're an originalist defines that as original public meaning originalism. So in that sense, my view has been adopted. Scalia's view and my view have been adopted by a majority. However, we still haven't gotten originalist judges to take things like the Ninth Amendment seriously, to take the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment seriously. We haven't gotten the judges who profess a commitment, a sincere commitment to originalism, to actually take on the whole Constitution. The, restore, the, the lost Constitution has not been restored fully or even you know, to a great degree by the judges who are originalists, I believe in good faith. They have other doctrines like uh, precedent, stare decisis, and other things they use to qualify their conclusions about what the original meaning is. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the role of judges, and they you know, believe in judicial restraint and against judicial activism, which would be interfering with the legislative branch. They have all these associated sets of beliefs in addition to being originalists, and that keeps them in many ways from restoring the lost constitution. Well, let's talk about actually how you have been trying to restore the Ninth Amendment. I mean, and I guess this is why you bookend, maybe not, maybe I'm reading into it, the book with those two, those two cases, right? Reich. And so I just, again, not a legal scholar. This is why I really kind of really enjoyed about reading the book is like, I, I'd heard obviously of these cases from the libertarian angle, but to me, what was really absolutely uh, more interesting. And that's, since I've been reading, you have also been reading realizing that like court cases is just a a wrong way to look at it as kind of, they may have libertarian implication or conservative implication, but really ultimately the way legal scholars and judges think about the cases they have in front of them is not about, oh, let's go for right? Let's go for a libertarian understanding or, I mean, and so now I'm really annoyed, thanks to you, when I hear people commenting on Supreme Court cases. 
and just base, basically think, oh, this is a conservative court there. That's why they ruled like this, blah, blah. When ultimately it's just about so, so much more. And, and, and this book kind of confirmed this about how complicated. So can you tell us the significance of, of, of Reich, the one that you actually you went before the Supreme Court and did it yourself and you explain right. in details how, like the, the significance of Reich for kind of trying to restore the Ninth Amendment. Sure. Well, uh, the book does start and end or more or less end with two yeah. cases. I've been involved, I've really only been involved in three constitutional cases. And one would think, and all three went to the Supreme Court. So people who don't know me assume that if I've had three cases that go to the Supreme Court in one form or another, then I must be involved in lots of cases because very few cases go to the Supreme Court. Turns out those are the only three I've really been involved mm -hmm. with. I, def I consider myself to be a legal scholar, a legal theorist. I'm not a litigator, although I've learned a ton from being involved in this litigation. And the, the, the book starts with the Rach case, uh, which was the medical marijuana case out of California, which was ultimately decided in 2005. And then before I turn to getting a more originalist judiciary, I talk about the National Federation of Independent Business versus Sibelius case, which is the Obamacare case, which I was instrumental in developing the theory about why the individual insurance mandate was unconstitutional. So the case, so there's, so there's that, these are like bookends in the, in my book. And the reason for organizing it this way is that, you know, I, it, it's not a good way to do a memoir to just start by, I was born in a log cabin in Calumet City, Illinois. I mean, nobody cares. You have to make the reader care about the person who's telling you this stuff. So the way I did it is I started with this big case that I worked on. Uh, the only case I argued in this, I've ever argued in the Supreme Court and what went, went into that. Uh, and then at the end of those chapters about that case, one hopes that the reader is now going to say, well, you know, I'm kind of interested in who this guy is. So now let's go back and see and find out who this guy is. And then it culminates in this other big case, which people know about. So one of the thing, one of the lessons of doing this uh, work is that you can't really litigate by trying to, uh, sometimes you can, but in both of these cases, I did not litigate. Uh, in terms of the original meaning of the Constitution or the Ninth Amendment or even the Commerce Clause, which is what the cases were really mm -hmm. about. And what I was trying to do was argue that, I un that, that Supreme Court doctrine would give us the result we wanted. What the Supreme Court had said in Wickard, like we said before, and Darby and Lopez and Morrison, these Commerce Clause cases, supposedly Commerce Clause cases. So what happened was I when I got in, I got involved in the Rach case, the medical marijuana case, because of the Ninth Amendment, and that is because the trial judge, Charles Breyer, Justice Breyer's brother, had asked the parties to brief the Ninth Amendment in this medical marijuana case. So they went around the country trying to find somebody who knew about the Ninth Amendment, came to me because I was the nation's leading yeah. authority on the Ninth Amendment. We established that earlier in the podcast. And so they came to me, and sure enough, this was, it could conceivably be about the Ninth Amendment. I helped them with the trial brief. As, as they always do, the judge lost all interest in the Ninth Amendment shortly after that. But it was actually a Commerce Clause challenge, and I became involved in this Commerce Clause challenge, which then led me to learn a lot more about the Commerce Clause than I previously had known, both the original meaning of the clause and Supreme Court doctrine. And in the course of litigating the Rage case and why it was, I could argue that Supreme Court precedent uh, did not support the constitutionality of the federal government stopping people from growing marijuana in their backyard to use as uh, for medical purposes as authorized by state law, that Supreme Court doctrine did not support that like, over extensive use of federal power. It really taught me what Supreme Court doctrine really was better than other law professors knew about it from teaching it. They were more, I don't want to say lazy, they were more imprecise in what was the the underlying theory, the coherent theory of this doctrine. Uh, for one thing, they missed the fact that this is all basically doctrine about the meaning of the necessary and proper clause, not the commerce clause, which is something mm -hmm. that's not the way that people teach it. The necessary and proper clause is a separate power that gives Congress the power to make all mm -hmm. laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, including the commerce clause, and that these cases, Wickard and Darby and Lopez and Morrison, they're really necessary and proper clause cases. You have to be understood that way. And it was because of all that doctrinal background. Well, when we lost the case, and of course- Spoiler alert, we lose the Rage case six to three. My feeling was that this was now the most expansive reading of the Commerce Clause and Necessary and Proper Clause ever done. There's nothing Congress can't do anymore under this clause. And so that's the end of my knowledge. That's the end of the relevance of all this knowledge I built up because we lost. Except 
except spoiler, another spoiler alert, and that is that Congress decided to do something it had never done before. Instead of stopping you from growing a plant in your backyard, it made you do business with a private company. It would be as though they passed a law that said you must grow marijuana in your backyard Mm -hmm. under the Commerce Clause, coupled with the Necessary and Proper Clause. And I I saw early on that this was a problem under Supreme Court doctrine that previous, because this law was never done before, there's a pretty good chance it's not justified by the precedents that have come before because the courts never considered this before. That automatically gives room for a challenge. And that's when I developed the theory about why the individual insurance mandate, the individual purchase mandate, was unconstitutional. And unlike in Rage, where we only got three votes, in NFIB, we got five votes for our theory of why the individual purchase mandate was unconstitutional. So normally, if you win on the law, you win the case. If you've lost the case, it's because you've lost on the law. And yet in this case, we got five votes for the idea that purchase mandates are not justified by the Commerce Clause or the Necessary and Proper Clause. Well, how do we lose the case? We lost the case because our fifth vote by Chief Justice John Roberts, a conservative Republican nominee, he, he said that, uh, sure, he agrees that if this statute called for a purchase mandate, it would be unconstitutional. You are correct. You're right. But I and that is the most he also said that is the most natural reading of the statute. You're right about that, too. But this, there's another reading of the statute. Which led to said, your mom thinking you had won the case. Because yeah, well, Fox News and CNN uh, announced we had won the case because that was the first half of his opinion. And he's reading it out loud. Or, or they got a copy of it and they were skimming it. And they saw the beginning of it saying we were right. And therefore, mm-hmm. we must have won the case. And so Fox announces we'd won. I was sitting in my office at, Boston, at, at Georgetown monitoring it on SCOTUS blog, which was a website, and I knew we'd lost. And my mom texts me, oh, you won, you won. And I had to text her back. In fact, even to this day, it makes me feel sad to have to have told my mom that we lost. And she goes, no, but Fox News said you won. Um, I said, no, no, mom, we lost. And it was, I, it, it makes me feel bad right now, remembering having I'm to sorry. tell you this. So, But you won, said, but you won well, but before in I get that, important here, ways. I have to explain yeah, how Roberts yeah. ruled. And Roberts said, it was a. It was reasonably possible, not the natural reading. It was reasonably possible to read the statute as essentially giving people an option to buy health insurance or pay a non-coercive tax, and because that would be within the tax power of Congress to do that, which frankly it isn't. But nevertheless, he said that we he upholds the law because it's really he construed it as an option to buy health insurance not a mandate not a requirement the, the statute says requirement enforce then or pay a tax the statute says a penalty he changes the statute so he can uphold the law and that's how we lose now that had a big societal consequence i think because that was at the uh, the peak of the tea party movement here in the united states the tea party movement was both a grassroots libertarian movement small l libertarian movement and it was a grassroots movement about the constitution it we we had a for the first time in my lifetime hundreds of thousands of individual americans gathering in public places to demand a return to the constitution and it was galvanized. It started before Obamacare started. It, it had to do, it was originated during the Bush bailouts of the banks and things. That's what started it going. But when Obamacare came along, the Tea Party movement took this as opposition to this. And once we had a lawsuit, a constitutional challenge that took two years to litigate, they became more and more invested in the lawsuit, in my opinion, thinking we were obviously right, uh, thinking, having much more confidence in our case than even I had. And then when Roberts pulls the football out, like Lucy pulls the football out from Charlie Brown, I think that crushed the Tea Party movement. That plus the IRS, what they were doing to the Tea Party movement, there were a lot of things crushing it. The fact that the Republican establishment never liked the Tea Party movement because they wanted radical change and the Republican establishment didn't want any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to keep doing business as, as usual with the Chamber of Commerce or whatever. So because the Tea Party movement saw what Roberts did, I just think it just crushed them. And Roberts said, you know, it's not for the court to protect your liberties. You've got to go out and protect your liberties yourself. You know, you, and so I think that is what led them eventually to abandon this movement for the Constitution. And sadly, it's been abandoned. Yeah. And instead found somebody like Donald Trump to be their personal paladin, mm-hmm. you know, 
Roberts was said, go out and win elections and get your way that way. And so they said, okay, you know, screw the constitution. I, not Maybe not literally, but they, that whole constitutional moment passed sadly because of what John Roberts did. But, um, and we've been living in the consequent in the aftermath of that ever since. No, politically, we certainly have. And I think it will have really dramatic consequences economically. That said, I mean, there are ways in which the Robert decision also is going to, I assume, have positive and important implication for the future. Well, the most obvious one is he said purchase mandates are unconstitutional. Exactly. So we, were, we, were, we were fighting two things. We're fighting against the constitutionality of purchase movements, purchase uh, mandates. The second thing is we were fighting against the theory that was advanced by the government and law professors as to why purchase mandates were okay. We beat both those things. Yes. Under this ruling, Congress cannot impose purchase mandates on the people. They can do this. They could do a tax incentive if they want to. But a tax incentive precludes, for example, putting you in jail for not having health insurance, Mm -hmm. something they could have done if the government's argument had been accepted. They could have, if this was a commerce clause regulation, you can enforce that by prison. So get health insurance or go to jail. The NFIB versus Abelia said, no, you can't do that because that's unconstitutional. So we beat purchase mandates for the future. That's why there haven't been any since then. This, this one time only thing is one time only. And the theory that said basically Congress has a national problems power, which we also beat back in the Rach case as well, which was an argument made then. Mm -hmm. Uh, We beat that that, and we reaffirmed the idea that Congress really is one of limited and enumerated powers, uh, even if the court is not prepared to limit them as much as the Constitution does. And in that sense, isn't that kind of kind of an indirect victory for the Ninth Amendment? The Ninth Amendment says that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. How does the Constitution protect these other rights retained by the people? They do so first and foremost with by limiting federal power so that the federal government does not violate the rights of the people in the first place. So no. Um, and yeah, so, sorry, yes, no. if we hold go- yeah. the federal government to its limited powers, then we are, in fact, that's one of the ways in which the Constitution mm-hmm. protects the rights retained by the people, the unenumerated rights that are not listed in the Constitution. The Constitution does other things besides that. It protects the rights of the people against the states through the 14th Amendment. And as you already remarked upon it, as we talk about in our 14th Amendment book, uh, the Supreme Court gutted that as well because that was an attempt to essentially create a, judicial, a federal judicial remedy against states abusing our, their powers against the people. Uh, the rights of the people. So yes, every time we hold government to its enumerated powers, to its limited powers, we are in effect protecting the retained rights, uh, the rights retained by the people. So we don't really have any time left, but I want to ask you advice for um, young listeners. And I'm I'm thinking mostly my daughters, but (laughs) hopefully there are others. Your career, reading this book, right? It's just one, it's not a straightforward path to where you are now, right? And it's also, there are many instances in the book where it seems to me that being a prosecutor, for instance, even though it seems it has nothing to do with what you're doing now, is actually was really, really useful. And I, I, I want to believe there's, there's a lesson there for aspiring... Sure scholars or well, I wrote the book with hoping to teach a lot of lessons about for people who are younger people like I was when I was 12 years old debating on behalf of Barry Goldwater. I do want to say the last part of the book is about how the role I played in getting an originalist judiciary. So the book doesn't end with NFIB versus yeah, yeah. Sibelius. We go on to how it is we got Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Barrett, mm-hmm. and even Justice Jackson on the court uh, who profess mm-hmm. a commitment to the original meaning of the Constitution. But the main purpose of the book is not to toot my own horn, but is to provide life lessons on how you get to be somebody like me. So uh, here's the first problem that young people have when they look at someone like me, assuming they've read my work or they think something about me. I'll never be like that. Look, that guy is special. That guy is smart. You know, I, I, I can't be compared. You know, there's no way I'll ever be him. And I think that's always an unfair comparison because they should be comparing themselves with the, the 12-year-old Randy Barnett, the 18-year-old Randy Barnett, not the 72-year-old Randy Barnett, who has had a lot of stuff under, my, under his belt. So one of the lessons of the book is, look how far I came and look all the mistakes I make. I'm very candid in the book, as you know about the mistakes that I've made. So you don't have to make them. Maybe you can avoid them. 
So number one, be realistic about who you're comparing yourself with. Don't compare yourself with senior people who have already had a lifetime of accomplishments and work and have developed themselves. Compare, you know, that's not a fair comparison to you. Compare yourself to what they were probably like when they were young, younger, and you'll find you're much more likely to do it, to be able to, you know, be a fair comparison and not be discouraged. Get mentors, cultivate mentors, be a good protege, be mean good to your mentors. You know, don't don't just take them for granted, you know, pay back pay them back as well and work on things sort of one step at a time. When I just, I just, you know, first it was, you know, uh, I was a, com- I was a contracts guy and I had a, developed a theory of contract law and then I uh, started working on the ninth amendment. And from the ninth amendment, I started working on the commerce clause from the commerce clause. Well, it turns out that's really the necessary and proper clause. And then from there, I went to the, the second amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. So, so it's like one thing after another, and you just are patient and never give up sort of keep, always keep the big picture in view don't give up. Don't get discouraged. And I, I say, I don't even know if I say this in the book, but do this for the love of learning. Don't do this for changing society. Don't make the change of society. Don't make your happiness contingent on the society changing for the better, because that's really not in your control. Do it for the love of learning and the truth. Do it simply because you want to make a you want to make the world a better place. And how do you make the world a better place that's within your power to do? Add to the store of human knowledge at the margin. Yeah. So every article I write that is truer than what people thought before I wrote it, like here's the original meaning of the Ninth Amendment, or here's really what Wickard versus Filburn is about, or here's what really the Commerce Clause is about, or here's what our natural rights are about. Every time I write one of those articles or I publish it in a book, if you just keep it in your head, you're not making the world a better place. You've got to publish it and get it out there so that you will increase the store of human knowledge. That makes the world a better place, even if no one ever agrees with you. Mm -hmm. It's now out there. It's in the record. And other people can come along and be inspired by it and learn by it the way I was inspired by Lysander Spooner. Look what Lysander Spooner did. He's a very obscure guy. He wrote a lot, though. He just It didn't die with him. It survived him. So a a guy like me, a young professor like me, could see a footnote to a book he wrote a hundred years, hundred and I don't know, hundred and fifty years later, whatever it was, and say, "Wait a second, I think this guy's onto something," and then run with it, and ultimately end up with an originalist judiciary because of this book that Lysander Spooner wrote in eighteen forty-five. That Lysander Spooner made the world a better place just by publishing that book, increasing the store of human knowledge, and being around to influence me, and that's what I'm hoping to do with my writings as well as with this particular book. I'm hoping that by the, writing this book, I will be increasing the sum of human knowledge, if only to tell people what my story was so my grandchildren can read it and figure out what their grandfather had done with his life. And then you can you, your happiness is then contingent on what's within your power to accomplish. It's not contingent on changing the world, which is not within your power to accomplish. That's a way of condemning yourself to unhappiness. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have to end there. I had so much more to ask you, but... Brandy, thank you so much. And really, everyone, I really highly recommend A Life for Liberty, The Making of an American Originalist. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having me, Vernick. I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs>